Okay. Hey, Manu. Hi there, Mert. Hi, everyone. Hello. Hello. Let's wait a couple of minutes. Soul sister will come, I guess. I don't know. I don't know why why she's muted uh, by an admin by the server. How? Well, I guess it's like a coup. <laughs> yeah. Coup against stewards. Um. Yeah, Seb. I don't know why your server muted or how to unmute you <laughs> oh i your your server muted from the stewards call last week um but i don't know how to unmute you <laughs> do we have any like mod moderator uh i think let me check i'll i'll, I'll call on someone There's liable to be a fist fight if there's no moderator, right? That sarcasm. I know my style is pretty dry. Uh, apologies. No worries. We're we're on it. Someone, I've uh. Posted a call to stewards. So, I guess from today's agenda, I will present uh, the research groundwork. <coughs> so, so sister, huh, okay. So, uh, uh, let me present what I'm thinking about the future research groundwork and have your opinion. Thank you guys. So in this presentation, as we have discussed, I would like to talk a little bit about a future, a future research groundwork for the Omega Working Group that we will add to our uh, proposal. So I call this presentation Rethinking Token Engineering Parameters. So starting with what token engineering is, I quote the very first article that <clears throat> used the term token engineering. So this the term has been flipped by Trent 
McDonaghy in 2018. In his article, he stated that the blockchain community understands that blockchains can help align incentives among a tribe of token holders. Each token holder has skin in the game, but the benefit is actually more general than simply aligning incentives. You can design incentives of yours, choosing by giving them block rewards. Put another way, you can get people to do stuff by rewarding them with tokens. Blockchains are incentive machines. And in the conclusion part, he stated that objective function design aka incentives aka incentive design is hard, but we have to try. To do a good job, we need solid engineering theory, practice, and tools. That is token engineering. So, as we can see, uh, how the origins of token engineering drive is very much related to incentivization and incentivization design and objective design. So, while we are actually <coughs> creating token systems, we are conditioning some behaviors over some others. So, I just wanted to show this little graph, like good old social science dilemma. So agent is affecting structure, or the structure is affecting agent. It's like uh, hard to hard to answer question which one is the dominant uh, parameter that is affecting each other. But at the end, we know that structures or agents sometimes uh, affecting each others. Uh, for after the uh, integ uh, after the engagement between the agent and structure, we will have a new structure that will affect agent. And the, uh, this agent will affect the structure again, so this will be like a vicious. Uh, this will be like a cycle that is ever growing structure and agent component. So in our way, case, I, I have an expanded uh, version of that, uh, just in case you ever want it. Yeah, sure. Thank you so much. So in our case, agents are the token users, and the structure is token engineering uh, engineering parameters. So. So what what I wanted to talk about is that so while we are creating these incentives for the agents, we are actually conditioning some specific behaviors that can also be considered as moral behaviors. So because, for example, while we are <coughs> emphasizing some some behaviors through our incentive alignments, we are not emphasizing some others. So these these behaviors create the moral agent of us. Of course, it's not totally deterministic. Of course, character, culture, etc., is affecting our behaviors very highly. But as as a as a parameter, structure is also conditioning our behaviors. And at the end, our behaviors is creating a moral system of us that we live in as within a society. So, so. I wanted to say this is not very unique to actually token engineer or blockchain space in general. So in 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 traditional world, let's say, we have been seeing similar practice uh, co practiced by central banks. So central banks as highly centralized bodies has been conducting their duty to manage economic policy of countries. So they are printing money, they are uh, hijacking, uh, they are increasing interest rates, they are playing all those parameters according to, like token engineers, they are designing incentives for according to country's need. So this is the trickier part. So what is the need of a country? So this is a very high dimensional thing. So for example, if you are a cent, if you are if you are coming from a central bank which is highly centralized and you are a Harvard graduate living lived in a very privileged position for so long time so your incentives may not be aligned for example let's say an immigrant in your country so need is a crucial word here that has been used by <coughs> economists as thinking that economics is a science so it's fulfilling a need but what it actually fulfills is a sort of choices. So we, I think it's kind of impossible to say that economics is a science like physics because it entails choices over human capacity. So I wanted to give a, one example 
about central banks. So in 1979, after the stagflation crisis, like high, high inflation and high employment in all over the world, uh, United States Finance Minister Paul Volcker initiated his famous policy called Volcker Shock. So he introduced unprecedented interest rates when U U.S. inflation rates were double digits. The negative interest rate at the time of before the shock suddenly increased to more than 5% real interest rate. So, so uh, again, when we go back to the discussion of need, so this creates two different solutions, two different outcomes. One is this caused sharp recession and rapid unemployment increase. Unemployment rose 5% to 10% between 1970 to 1979 to 1982, whereas inflation fell from 13% to 3%. So which one is an accomplishment? It's a good question to ask. So, for example, according to Wikipedia, he was widely credited with having ended the high inflation of levels of the United States. So it's an accomplishment for some people, but... Increasing unemployment is kind of not accomplishment for some other. So while we are thinking about designing incentives, we should consider that there is there is many outcome that that can affect somebody's position. So we should take consider not just parameters of like uh, having best, for example, in terms of blockchain space. We we should consider not just like the best liquidity pools or like more uh, lo total locked value, etc. But also we need to think that how will this affect our society, like is thinking as cyber society, our society, and how will, how will this affect uh, moral behaviors of our agents? So how does DAOs are different in terms of doing this token engineering? So we have more democratic approach. We are participating in uh, mechanism design, for example, for the uh, ABC augmented bonding curve, which we together choose like exit tribute, um, all those parameters, like conviction voting parameters. So this is a good part that DAOs are different in terms of doing it. And other difference is the source of legitimacy so, for example, even though there's a hierarchical rela relationship in our DAO, like, for example, there's stewards, there's contributors, there's leads for some working group, treasury managers. But the source of legitimacy in the, for example, in the case of central banks, it's technocracy. Mm -hmm. So if you go to the best schools, etc., regardless of the mm -hmm. community's opinion, you will be appointed as the high level bureaucrat so in central banks there's no uh, democratic participation even slightest but in our community legitimacy comes from uh, mostly from your community so for example if we wanted to nominate somebody as stewards we need community's approval for example in transparency working group the treasury manager is to decide it together as far as I followed, etc. And the accountability structure. So here the accountability is coming from communities uh, feeling about what's going on, I feel like. But in the case of traditional uh, entities, it's more about numbers and discussions of certain groups' advantage. So it's less uh, community-based and more special group-based. So these are the good things. But however, what I believe, what we are missing is that even though these are good things that we are participating in mechanism design, we are creating different sorts of legitimacy and accountability structure, we have been engaging very little about how those, that, that I mentioned, how those parameters affect our moral behavior. So uh, Nick wrote, wrote a very good comment. For example, high entry tribute may increase people's uh, motivation about creating narrative on uh, TC because they will they, they believe that common pool will have more money so they can get benefited more. So, but we are kind of misleading this moral aspect of token engineering.
So from our Omega Manifesto, I wanted to read a quote. We wanted to explore contextual ethics in token engineering and not a prescriptive normative one as third mode of ethical thinking, even go further and enable learning how to apply multiple modes of ethical reasoning. This is so this is to strengthen awareness about trade-offs we make and legitimacy of algorithmic policies we devise, which create global token economies where where a multitude of worldviews always coexist. So as the this quote says, I think in this research we should uh, we should understand what what's the trade-off are we are ma- are we making? For example, while we are employing token-based voting, it will maybe become more appealing to <coughs> uh, token holders. But if we are uh, doing a governance mechanism based on reputation points or reputation tokens, it may be more uh, appealing to contributors. So there's always trade-off between the parameters and how those parameters uh, triggers one's uh, behaviors. So in this research, what I wanted to do is that I don't have like uh, clear examples of it, but I want to do a theoretical research how the parameters conditions someone's behavior and how those behaviors turn into a societal behavior like culture in the society. So we want to do, I want to like, I would propose we can do a theoretical research like about ethics, psychology, decision making, and param- uh, in also the technical parameter side and we can come up with some case studies that i discussed as in the walker shock and we can have a comparative research about it and and after the this this research period we can have some possible outcomes such as participatory action research research papers and learning groups so that's that was my presentation actually thank you so much uh, Thank you. That, so, that that was very. Um, can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you. Okay, cool. So uh, good to be heard again. <laughs> no, thank you for the preparation. Uh, it was really uh, soothing to see the uh, and that we could focus on on main points. So thanks for the preparation. In any case, and I would actually uh, just leave the floor for comments. Um, but definitely want to add, uh, you know, if you just keep sharing the presentation, um, I think it's, right. you picked a really nice point, but uh, yes, please everyone chime in. Oh. Yeah, like I had the first uh, way of thinking about it, it rings some bells in my mind about like a, a, a transition from this from biopolitical control, like a Foucauldian paradigm or episteme mm-hmm. to like societies of control and kind of uh, algorithmic, uh, uh, how to say mm-hmm. like algorithmic, algorithmic enterprises, like corporate algorithmic forms of governance. Mm-hmm. towards like neuro marketing and all these kind of new forms of yeah. analytic uh, behavioral sciences so my thoughts are going a bit like how to think about it from a lacanian point of view between like the lacanian versions of thinking about formalism and uh, more deleuzean forms of uh, forms of divi- uh, individuals and you know this kind of societies of control that we're getting into so these are like the associations mm-hmm. that just uh, resonated when we you were talking. Mm-hmm. Did did anything resonate? Uh, even if you followed with what you had once briefly mentioned about um, the ethics of opting out, I know it comes from a different perspective, but it just resonates on on so many levels. The, do you do you see it here as well, or is it? Uh, uh, more concrete in a in a different com- context. Are you directing this to me or? Yes, yes. 
Do you remember ethics of opting out? You wanted to... Yeah, yeah, it's like uh, the queer... Uh, yeah, I've been... Mm -hmm. I was reading this a while ago. Yeah, for sure there's some parts in this, but I have to reread it because I don't directly connect gotcha. it to this. Gotcha. Okay, okay. No, I just... I was just fishing with strawberries. <laughs> yeah, yeah, Thanks. yeah. Like, uh, I'm, yeah, currently I'm, I'm also taking notes. Yeah. yeah. Okay, cool. I'm taking notes, Matt. So, um, everyone, feel free to chime in. What I notice is jumps out at me that I um, that I think you're sort of speaking to, but I didn't see in the presentation um, in relation to these trade-offs and externalities are <laughs> unintended consequences, the the second order and network effects mm -hmm. of these decisions, and how a question is sort of like kind of on the tip of my tongue about like. What what would we do if we made a choice and then realized, oh shit, you know, there is a there is a second order consequence that it is unexpected, right? Is mm -hmm. there would is there a possibility space of building in some evaluation into the proposal period just to to do some to just check and, and look into these things and then how might we respond? Anybody else? So practically, you know, we're big fans of feedback loops, <laughs> uh, exactly to make those effects at the very least visible. However, I feel like with DAOs, it reminds me of E.O. Wilson, you know, uh, our tragedy is that <laughs> we have uh, paleontologic um, emotions, medieval institutions and godlike technology. like. We're not um, fast enough to, to catch up. And the human side of things um, just create those runaway effects. However, I believe because the context of token engineering common is this, hey, <laughs> we're testing this out. Uh, we're starting um, with testing the common stack. Um, it's called iteration zero. You can also stumble upon that in uh, one hive, for example. So we are the first communities to say, let's let's take this for a ride. Uh, for example, I don't know if anyone of you ever wondered, you know, why are we so keen on um, participate, having everyone's participation in deciding parameters, but who decided that we're going to use an augmented bonding curve? Uh, you, you know, so th these are really just a uh, partial experiment. Um, feedback loops are important. And I believe in the common stack, in, in the vision of common stack, it's a big part of the puzzle piece as well. There are like these puzzle pieces, right? But it's not yet implemented. So um, I would add to what Jeremy points out is, how do we make clear, you know, if this is an experiment and that's, that goes into uh, ethics of experimentation, how do we make clear that, you know, people are riding a car with uh, the engines <laughs> are still being uh, worked on and maybe some safety belts uh, aren't even in the car and so on. Um, and maybe that's one of the things that uh, people now coming in um, don't get that feeling that we're, you know, building the car, that we're going for a test drive, but maybe, yes. So ethics of experimentation, how to make clear uh, that if things are missing, right, that we know um, that these are white areas. Yeah, makes sense a lot. Resonates a lot. Um, the thing I was going to say was um, what following up with what Jeremy, I'm I'm constantly reminded of of the um, Six Sigma idea of the hidden factory, 
there's this idea that, you know, you built this factory and then you put a human being inside of it and then suddenly realize that the human being who's dealing with this has to um, come up with their own little hidden factory inside of it because there was some process that you forgot about. <laughs> and so, um, yeah. And so, like, you know, if it's like, you know, we're stamping metal, you know, and you've uh, you've accounted for the fact that that there are these waste products that come out. But then there's a lot of dust, like metal dust that has to take place. So they have to create their own process for cleaning up all the metal dust, which then also invades the machine that's designed to do the stamping. And there's all these additional processes which happen that because you didn't think about ahead of time, then, you know, end up uh, being things called hidden factories. And I do think um, a bit of a Six Sigma uh, level awareness would, would help in terms of uh, identifying, you know, hidden factories. And I, th I feel like what I'm kind of trying to do is take a look at the psychosocial nature of the hidden factories and uh that's part of the reason why i'm so excited to uh to s sort of see what jeremy and uh lean are bringing to the bring into the picture with uh liberating structures so how could those those hidden factories or those that could be applied in maybe the practical part of this uh research like when we're so would would that uh, framework or, or practice help us see what are the hidden factories well, uh, I think, um, within our you, experimentation? If you look at the um, hidden factory thing called TRIZ, which basically sort of mm -hmm. preempts um, you to, um, you know, uh, basically take a look at, you know, um, identify an unwanted result, right? So that mm -hmm. literally is like a proactive version of looking for hidden factories, <laughs> right? So, um, okay. so uh, yeah, so that's a that's a thing that you could use. And I think I might have, uh, I mean, I've got the cards here, but um, there's a PDF you can download from liberatingstructures.com. Um, you know, so that that could uh, we could have a whole meeting using Triz, and maybe. Uh, Jeremy would be kind enough to, you know, uh, lead us through that. But um, anyway, that's uh, my thought as a practical way mm -hmm. of getting it done. Mm -hmm. Thank you. And I think yeah. to maybe put a punctuation on that, it, the the invitation is very much to is mostly about the recognition that these that this concept exists this hidden factory this um this unexpected consequence exists so how can we be proactive in searching for them uh, more so than you know any particular intervention it's just like hey you know it, did we look for any hidden factories mm -hmm. uh, anybody else yeah um i'd say that uh we have to be very careful about the all these ceteris paribus that are lurking around the corner and and uh, i mean i think uh, you soul system mentioned the what is being left out and i don't know what this hidden factories uh framework is about but I guess it's uh, trying to get at the same thing, basically. Um, mm -hmm. I think that it seems to me like this way of framing things is a bit too behaviorist. Uh, it, it doesn't um, in, incorporate an internality in terms of the agents. Uh, mm -hmm. For example, their intentions, their agency, how do they, per do they perceive things? Their experience. So, an aspect of qualitative research of and a phenomenological framework that could uh, that could be incorporated um, with all of uh, the rest, I think, mm -hmm. would shed some light to all these um, mm -hmm. um, aspects of internality that, that are. Um, Missing from this agent uh, system duality that I see here. 
Yeah. Mm, so I think sure. that's the main group. Uh, the, the, the main focus or why we're here is exactly to make space for, for that, the, the, um, the, the self, basically the agents, uh, participation and focus groups could be one part. And I do believe that, uh, especially the facilitation techniques that Durga does and also Jeremy bring in, can help us to create those spaces where agents, if you will, like us, our participants, can uh, freely speak, but also in a way that is structured that we see um, or, or we can talk about those um, internal drives, motivations, uh, state of being, if you will. But yeah. when you said to behaviorist, I think you wanted to get at something mm. more like from the token engineering perspective as to behaviorist or yeah yeah this is what I, <laughs> I mean i wouldn't i wouldn't actually call it behaviorist it wouldn't be the right term um but i mean it is based on all this framework of systems thinking and uh it uh, models stuff dynamically to dynamical systems mm -hmm. theory, which is all, I mean, it is all about some basic forms of interactions that still mm -hmm. um, are um, externalist in a sense. They, they don't yeah. take into yeah. account yeah. factors uh, that have to do with the self-organization and the internal milieu mm -hmm. of uh, mm -hmm. organism, of, of agents as organisms. Like yeah. it, it is the, 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 the biological nature of na agents yeah. that is, missing like from the whole uh, tech thing, I think. Uh, but this is another issue. Um, but we don't have to uh, bring uh, open this whole Pandora box right here now, but it, it would be good to just start <laughs> thinking about it. <laughs> I, just, um, I just have a quibble in the definition uh, aspect. It sounds to me like you're saying biological system biological systems and systems thinking at the same in the same breath and i would say that a biological system is a, is the very definition of a complex system that is uh and the way that i would typically talk about a, a you know systems thinking would be you know like things that are using governing constraints all law and f and whereas a uh, Whereas a, a biological system is more complex, therefore we have um, more like enabling constraints versus you know governing constraints, or the combination of both of those together that uh, makes makes more sense in a biological setup. So I just you know I just want to make sure that people aren't hearing uh, governing bounded you know stuff when we're talking about a biological system. Or is it that you're saying that we should we should actually survey the closed loop stuff that we know about biological systems to gain insight into that? So I'm just looking for a clarification. Uh, yeah, this is this is actually a very good uh, concern that you're raising here. Um, yeah, I mean it is it is about framing things. It's about different way of modeling things, mm -hmm. and um, although by Biological modeling uh, is um, often uh, often adopts a systemic thinking, a systems thinking perspective. Uh, like the the modeling itself and the way that mm -hmm. things are framed can still be very disembodied, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. very non situational, very abstract. Hey, can I have a comment on this? Yep. Yeah, I totally agree with it. So this is a very simplified thing. For example, of course, like ideology or like inner capabilities of agent affect how the agent gets engaged with the structure. Like, for example, let's think about Soviet Russia. Like there was shortages, etc. For some, it leads to overaccumulation of goods because there's fear of shortages. But for some others... <clears throat> Since the ideological component of the uh, state has also strong, it, it means uh, they are working hard towards the end goal. So, of course, the structure gets engaged differently with each agent. 
Mm-hmm. I totally agree with it. So there's inner component, but mm-hmm. like probably my polit- because of my political position, I tend to uh, argue that structures are more definitive than let's say m- most of the time than some other parameters. But of course, I acknowledge that like your identity, your where you grow up, etc., totally. In, uh, uh, affects how you engage with the structure. For example, in this mm-hmm. research, while we are talking about, maybe we can even talk about how the cultural approach is affecting uh, our mm-hmm. engagement with the structures. For example, like I, I remember I was watching a reward system video of a token engineering academy, like this nine hour long, all day long. So, <laughs> one of the speakers were talking about. Uh, how the diff- people from different culture were preferred to get paid. So he was uh, he was mentioning that people from uh, global south like Turkey, uh, Saudi Arabia, etc., were preferring set payments, and people from like Western Europe, etc., preferring more uh, bounty based and task based payments. Like he he did a research on this. So for example, of course. It, Structure, for example, task-based structure may cause stress and some unintended moral behaviors for some cultures, but for some it may cause more work and extra effort and extra incentivization. So I acknowledge that we should consider culture and ideology and all those other inner capabilities. Mm. Yeah, we can but inc- they, they are... Sorry, I need to jump in because everything you mentioned is not internal. It's still external. It's culture, society, and so on. And when I hear uh, Onipov <laughs> saying disembodied, I think he really wants to go into that, really the inner capacity. Like neurological, um, capacity, even more deeper. Yeah, or, or even more into the spiritual uh, path, maybe. I don't know. I'm having difficulties with spiritual because that's also very new agey but there is really i'll share something from nora bates later on and one thing is really the framing of things it's uh it's a really nice article about wayfinding or it's called wayfinding and she said well see uh, tragedy and common of commons and such um actually also uh, uh eleanor ostrom makes fun of that Thing. What that you just come up with, <laughs> with this idea of tragedy of commons, and he goes like, "Hey, imagine you're gonna, you know, um, die, and you know, uh, you have to make tough decisions, and who who shall die so someone else can survive, or who who should be surviving?" And Nora Bateson makes the same uh, example, like, like if you pr- frame things like, "Okay, everyone is going to." die you know and you have to make a decision there's only one 10 10 uh, places in this boat who shall die decide now like then uh, maybe some people you know will totally go oh my god let's take the best 10 and they're just going full full on let's solve this problem who should uh, who of 10 people should survive so uh, i don't know whatever can move on right but there will always be pro- people that say stop <laughs> you know who says that you know these boats and these 10 places are the only solution and uh, i think that type of capacity that you can break always as a human being you have that capacity you can always break free from whatever external paradigms uh, learning have been put on you and also from this perspective like you identify for example Matt with with your education your political views and I can relate to that very much (laughs) because coming into token engineering I was totally about you know data driven I even didn't like very much the systems thinking approach that opened me a little bit but now I definitely see that uh we are acting as if, you know, uh, we're just rational agent. And if we have only enough information, we're going to act rationally. But we just forget that many of these frameworks are given from a very constricted mindset. 
and we don't have to take those as as a given and there is definitely this new move i wouldn't say movement but um uh, another level of perspective that is opening up where people really um, question how they make decisions from what place like um, yeah so I think really two things that um, we should or, or I would like to also explore is um, this behaviorist um, Skinnerian uh, token economy uh, I think it's a really funny example of institutionalized humans and we're basically trying to institutionalize ourselves uh it, sometimes it feels like it like thou or die <laughs> uh you know it's not the only uh way forward or you know knowing that our tools suck maybe we shouldn't just uh, obey those machines yet um sorry i'm going too 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 mm -hmm. far but i just want to so this behaviorist part uh, i def it definitely resonates and there's a lot of um food for um thought and and uh dialogue there the second part is about how we frame things um we are very much um conditioned uh about framing things coming from yeah an uh, educated schooled approach um interestingly many of the systems thinking um pioneers or or modernists out there uh their schools called unschool <laughs> so there is this thing that we need to shed uh from um that we come from an industrial era education that has a mechanistic view and also you know yeah, if you really question, for example, trends, uh, world of you, you will also see it's very mechanistic. Um, and I'm really hoping that we will question our own world because it's really fun and liberating, actually, uh, when you find, uh, when you actually can see from outside your worldview, all of a sudden, <laughs> you know, uh, another level opens up. Um, and the second, the third part, uh, really the disembodied. Um, again, it's a very personal experience, uh, but maybe many other people can relate. Um, you know, if you're uh, in um, in this overachieving careerist path or coming from that, maybe you're not. But uh, it is very easy to be in your mind to solve problems. Uh, all the time uh, 60 hours a week and all of a sudden everything becomes this uh, mechanical thing that you just need to push in the right places and it does things um, and especially if you work with computers uh, you are disembodied you know you um, and and that uh, if that changes again it opens up really new capabilities um, uh, this inner world is something we don't really um, acknowledge, and I think that's that's a very very important part, and we should um, we should get it on the table, <laughs> on the discussion or dialogue table. Just want to say yeah. one thing. I understand that they think very wrongly. Thanks for clarifying. I was thinking more about structure versus cultural kind of. Mm -hmm. uh, okay. paradigm but uh, I didn't know those stuff very well like I haven't read comprehensively or anything probably so I would love to read please share those things mm -hmm. in your mind like it will be super mm -hmm. cool to discuss how those like cognitive liberation occur and how those like inner neurological even more kind of uh, mm -hmm framework capacities are working i don't know anything i i cannot give any uh, comments on it but i will read at least i can say but it will be super cool to edit on our research like groundwork as a part of the uh, mm. let's say, parameter like not mm. parameter yeah. parameter 
Yeah, or, or maybe we, you know, if it, um, because you also want to have a focus of research, right? You want to kind of say, okay, in three months, you will come out at the end with something. I, I see that, uh, you know, this last part may, may, A, it has to be more experiential in any case. So it just relates and I just take note of it, but um, it's okay. We can take it uh, to a separate or to a more practical uh, domain. Mm. That uh, yeah, it doesn't have to be part of this research uh, project that you're proposing. So, because you need to keep keep it somehow uh, manageable. Yeah, like I I understand. We need to provide something at the end of let's say three months, saying that okay, mm -hmm. we got funded, but we provide public good. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, I understand. So also, it's a big, huge research question. I don't know if Unipaf, you have uh, some ideas, or, uh, but for me, it's more like, uh, how do we even form a research question around that later part? Uh, uh, has uh, had his hand open for a while, so <laughs> I just noticed. Um, so oh, I'll yeah. answer to that after, after, after Dergades. Yeah, I would say that you know the places where the the complex and the, where mental models intersect is my um, is my particular interest. So mm -hmm. I'd just like to share with you some research that I'm doing in terms of. Uh, so I'm creating this uh, graphic, which is huge because it has an awful lot of things to talk about in it. Um, so, uh, but part of the thing to understand is that is that this is true, right? So all these things that we're talking about are bounded in this Mithya uh, sort of thing. But the, what you can see in here is that, that if you have, you know, six different people looking at the same thing, they can all be correct, but mm -hmm. the, the framings and answers are arbitrary and those framings and co concepts and everything are only real inside of the framing. And so it's important mm -hmm. that we kind of understand how to, um, uh, how to transcend and include a given framing. Do you know what I'm saying? From a, from mm -hmm. a skill perspective, um, I think especially for us, if we're talking about ethics, we have to be able to say, okay, there's this bounded uh, systems frame here, which uh, always kind of results in either or. And then I need to be able to pull myself up out of that and recognize that as a whole unto itself. And then I need to be able to move over and shift to perhaps a different mental model or um, that's part of the reason why I like, like liberating structures because I'm kind of a, of a reflexive reframer. Do you know what I mean? And what I love mm -hmm. about the liberating yeah. structures concept is that it does exactly that is it gives you ways of trans uh, right? Because of the fact that all of these answers and framings are arbitrary and they're only real inside the given framing. We, this is a thing I think we need to understand is the ground substance of all the things that we're going to create here and that's why i created this larger graphic to make sure that people understood that there is this concept of dependent origination and to understand that um the reason why you develop the habit of transclusion and pulling yourself up out of bounded context is because it more accurately represents the the reality which is not not able to be defined, but it's able to be experienced, which is what you were kind of mentioning earlier, which is it's there has to be an experiential component to it, right? So if we're going to include both sides of that picture, we need to understand that there are things we can talk about and there are things that we can experience and we cannot make those two things go together perfectly, mm -hmm. regardless. It's just structural mm -hmm. to the nature of the way we talk about things. That's first of all. Yeah. Second of all, there are narrative structures that can help you to understand things like what you were talking about, which is I'm all the time talking about the the um, pendulum between the self and the consciousness, which then interacts with the culture and worldview, which then creates a social system, which then ping pongs back to reaffect the w worldview and the culture and the individuals participating in that culture, right? So when we were talking before about you know, yeah. this kind of thing. We often uh, go diagonally and we skip over the fact that there is a 
culture and worldview aspect, which is which we have to travel through, right? So it's mm-hmm. not that it's just the society. It's not that it's just the individual. It's not that it's just <laughs> the system. It is the the interplay and the swing back and forth of the pendulum between the yeah. the the brain and organism. So for example, I have autism. So that affects my self and consciousness, mm-hmm. which affects how I interact with the culture and worldview, which affects the social systems that I'm going to participate in mm-hmm. with me uniquely. And so it's going to go back and forth and depending, depending on my own development, depending on the development of the culture and worldview I'm interacting with and depending on the culture and worldview of the social system and environment, that those are all going to have differing kinds of effects on me. And this is yeah. my particular. Can you leave right this now. open? Can you leave oh, this sure. open yeah. for one yeah. minute? Yeah. yeah, yeah. So actually, actually, we have a story uh, that relates to token engineering commons. Um, mm-hmm. And I would like to un- uh, ask, you know, the, the new ones, uh, how they see it. Uh, uh, you know, now you come in and there's this working group, Omega, talks about, uh, you know, more than... Uh, for sure. Yeah, more than the things that you <laughs> might have uh, expected when you hear token engineering. And actually, when token engineering common started, literally there was a clash. Um, of, again, I can speak personal, but I th- think that was really also a cultural clash because most of us are uh, and were in uh, the scientific rational. <laughs> Uh, uh, realm, let's put it that way, right? And uh, I, I felt really that token engineering commons, especially the people, uh, Griff, Livia, and so on, uh, um, Jessica, what a wonderful soul, right? She uh, definitely green. <laughs> no value communities, and, and uh, we were like, oh, as I mentioned, like model data driven, you know but roughly already understanding that you don't want to be someone who makes people do things if you don't know whether that's legitimate. And, you know, th- that was the, this big questioning arising, people understand that uh, this is a real powerful technology, godlike technology, uh, and we don't have the faculties. And it was, uh, for example, personal really big questions arising, and that's when uh, Dogadas literally fell onto the <laughs> Discord server uh, with this wonderful introduction, uh, you know, as it goes. Um, and by the way, um, you know, um, I'm autistic and it was so refreshing. And also in the same introduction, he was uh, actually introducing already all of this, uh, you know, fountain of knowledge. And that's also how, how this whole philosophy, token engineering philosophy started and why uh, working group Omega is here. Um, and this uh, four quadrants uh, is something that um, has also shaped the working group uh, until now. So we could add, add this, um, especially when we're you know, thinking about contextual ethics token engineering and when we want to take token engineering commons uh, as um, as a case study, for example. So we do have uh, definitely that linkage in here. I don't know if um, I, I saw that uh, Celo is also an interesting community um, um, where it is yeah, more about how do we organize the human fabric? Moving beyond our medieval institutions and uh, paleont- <laughs> uh, paleontologic um, emotions, kind of. Yeah, just wanted to make that point, actually. I had a question about like uh, behaviorism, like why the choice or is is the intention to make a critique of B.F. Skinner or what's this uh, interest in this uh, particular strain of psychiatry? Um, mm, but what do you mean? Because the, the token economy um, and also how we describe token engineering at first, like make people do things, behave. It is very behaviorist. Yeah, because for you, me, if you keep it that way. 
Yeah, if we talk about humans and things, like, I understand with my limited knowledge of, like, B.F. Skinner, it's like applying animal experiments with the presupposition it could work on humans if it works for pigeons or rats or dogs. It's quite a radical approach to... I mean, like, I can behave as a dog if I want to, but it's quite yeah. a bridge to take as an ethic. It's, it's my perception that um, Skinner is... Uh... Uh, what do you want to say? It's a bit of a old school um, kind of approach to things. Like he opened up a certain line of inquiry, but I don't. And that line of inquiry was very much in the um, uh, <clears throat> the industrialized uh, way of thinking. <laughs> do you know what mm -hmm. I'm saying? Um, yeah. And and there was a bunch of people that built on top of that. Even this model, I think, would say it's built on top of things like the old, the old school uh, Skinner and Maslow and, and the like, right? But um, Maslow. Yeah, you know, it kind of goes. Uh, basically, what what it's trying to do is this is basically a theory of everything, right? The whole idea that we can take all of human experience and and put it into a relatively simple graphic um, is this sort of, you know, idea. I just, you know, it's important, I think, to just recognize there are a lot of, um, a lot of narratives p just packed into this. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? Like, yeah. it's, like literally, you know, uh, the most packed thing you'll ever see probably, you know, like all of human mm -hmm. experience in every book ever written is <laughs> so packed into this thing. So yeah, but, once you look at it, it's like it's four useful. hours and then. <laughs> Yeah. So, <laughs> so we're coming it, uh, to, uh, unfortunately, we're coming too fast to a close again. And so that we mm, yeah. Include others. can say how we um, go about this research topic. Now, this research topic definitely uh, might um, fundamental. And if you could show your slides again. Yes, yeah, sure. Um, please. <laughs> Um, and in the meantime, is there any more addition, um, something we shouldn't forget that, or, or someone who would want to participate with a concrete perspective? Yeah, well, hey, how are you guys doing? Um, my name is David and... Hi, David. Pretty uh, hard, hard to follow the conversation because you guys are, um... <laughs> It's just have never haven't been in a conversation like this in a very long time. But just from the from looking, trying to kind of soak it up, uh, going to the whole Skinner thing um, and this research, it really seems like there's there might be some value in looking at this from a, a Skinner way. And that the 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 token, I don't know. I think of tokenomics, and I'm not an expert by any means, but just from my um, very limited understanding um just when you're developing any system the whoever designs the system is going to look for some kind of output right or for something that's some kind of outcomes and um that's how you that's how you start and that's how you build your system with a plan that something that you're expecting to happen is going to happen um i think mm -hmm. with the volker example the same thing i imagine volker had some kind of intention when um, they did that, that the, the central planning agencies, you know, jacked up interest rates and they expected some kind of outcome, whether they got what they wanted or not, um, you know, I, I don't, I don't know. But they did, did yeah. get some results. Um, so it yeah. seems like, like this whole thing needs to be kind of looked at from two different uh, exactly. frames. You know, you yeah, have, yeah. Have the, totally agree. The system is this but is this the only only way like we 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 say it is the only way like if you go out and do something you define the outcome and then you optimize for that outcome but there is the complex i'm sorry uh david please go ahead you weren't finished actually <laughs> oh no 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 problem um and feel free to stop me if i'm rambling i i i love the sound of my own voice a little bit too much, I've been told. <laughs> but the, um, so just from, you know, I, I don't know that I really understand the whole research that you're proposing, um, Mert, to tell you the truth, but so if you, it seems like you would want to pick 
some kind of thing to do some research on a system, some kind of tokenomics um, example, and, and and try to figure out this is. I mean, hopefully you would know what the intentions were and what the outcomes were, and then if they were different, um, that's when all of this other part would come in of of what were the agents. Mm -hmm. What was going on within inside the agents, you know, internal, what were the internal incentives, the internalized incentives that the agents were reacting to that the systems designers weren't. Um, and, mm -hmm. you know, on a large scale, I guess you could you could parse it out to to different cultures, um, you know, like someone was saying about uh, different parts of Europe, you know, Eastern Europe or Western Europe, how they, they react differently to different types of incentives or pay structures. Um, so, anyways, that's that's yeah. my thought. Here. I, I I don't really want to, you know. I just didn't so, want to get opportunity to talk to you guys and. and uh, no, welcome, yeah. welcome. And and basically, just to uh, take you on uh, up on that is uh, yeah the case studies um, as uh, March uh, you say we could have case studies. I think the easiest uh, case study would be token engineering comments. Um, yeah. Do do you have? Does anyone have uh, also other groups or other communities mm -hmm. from which they hope or believe they could get some insight? I have some in mind, but I'm not sure yet. <laughs> okay. As, uh, how so, how but... small or how big should it be? That's the. Is that the the scale issue is uh, very important here? Mm -hmm. So I think um, I don't know. Um, it should be that we should have access to you know five or six people who would want to participate in exchanging their uh, experience. So we get to the uh, qualitative parts uh, as well. Um, I think from the the. Um, like the system that has been engineered, it should be somehow online already so we can actually reason about and research what was intended and what was the outcome. So I don't know if the scale is an issue there yet. Oh, well, yeah, uh, I think accessibility. Dow... Really. Oh, sorry. Mm -hmm. I, I think Dow House is very welcoming to such uh, kind of experiments. Mm -hmm. This might be a good place to look at. Okay, yeah. do, you, do you have contact there? Um, I think I do. Kind of. <laughs> I can't yeah. can get in touch. Okay, okay. So, but at the very least, we can have at least one, uh, one study for sure. Um, Maybe also Sense Lab. I don't know if you. I, I wrote a comment in the document about uh, Aaron Manning in uh, Canada. They did a lot of research on neurodiversity and. Oh. Thank you. Oh, that, that's that's very good. That's very good. <laughs> N nice reference, Steph. <laughs> cool, cool. Thank you, Steph. So. Uh... I would like to add this as part of the research group's accountability mm -hmm. task. We will conduct this research project and with our initiatives. I will add this. Mm -hmm. Are you okay with it? You know, just yes, yes. I mean uh, that we make time and space for this in the working group uh, makes total sense. Um, it gives us more food for thought or food for conducting focus groups. Uh, I really like it. The only thing, uh, the, the top, the, the rethinking token engineering parameters, um, is it what we're doing? No, we, like, we're analyzing first. Yeah, this is very bad. <laughs> you know, uh, no, no mutiny. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. But, really um, like, I just prepared last mm. night. The slides are like not. Really no, easy. no. Thanks so much for preparing. It it really helped to focus the conversation. That's really cool. And yes, and if you go quickly to page six, uh, to slide six. Yeah, uh, and it is perfect uh, call for the working group Omega to really um, think mm -hmm. about what we have written. Like, can we contextualize? 
um, ethics uh, and really contextual in token engineering comments, meaning do we know the context of token engineering? And that type of work might be actually super, super uh, useful and interesting for yeah, anyone interested in, in token engineering comments history uh, and, and maybe a, another source of uh, onboarding people, um, giving them more context, uh, right? Uh, so I, I really look forward to this. I think this is going to be super, super useful, uh, also beyond our working group Omega. So thanks so much, Matt. Thank you so much. So cool. And yeah, uh, I think the ones who, who participated uh, lively uh, will also be the supporters. Uh, Dugit has had to leave, I see. But um, yeah, definitely. I'm sure of that. Okay.